um, I would like to uh, introduce yourself. So, Aslo, please introduce yourself and your company. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here today. My name is Ausla Magnus Dotter. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Tinker Tailor, a website that specializes in the sale of customized women's luxury fashion. We work with over 100 leading brands from around the world, ranging from Vivian Westwood to Marquesa to Preen. Prior to starting Tinker Tailor, most recently, I started another e-commerce site called Mode Operandi, which specializes in selling women's fashion straight off the runway. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Hakan. Uh, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Lidiana.com, a fashion e-commerce site from Turkey. And uh, prior to Lidiana, I was the co-founder of Peak Games, a social gaming company from Turkey. And I'm uh, Jason Goldberg, and I'm the founder and CEO of Hem, uh, which is a spin-out brand from a company called Fab, um, which a lot of people probably heard of. Um, and Hem is, um, we like to think that uh, if you were to imagine a furniture company five, ten years from now into the future, that's what we're trying to build at Hem. Um, what we are is a technology company that is trying to make design easy uh, for people, and we do that by designing our own, working with the world's most exciting young designers and exclusive passion with us, manufacturing their products, innovating on flat packing and on easy assembly and, and fast delivery, um, and doing so all in a consumer direct model to remove the middlemen, create lower prices and convenience for customers. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Oslo, you are in e-commerce since a very long time. What has changed in e-commerce in the last five years? So e-commerce has changed dramatically in the last five years. Just focusing on, on my area of expertise, which is luxury fashion, um, about five years ago, we, the market had really transitioned from being primarily promotion online to businesses building a big business for, for high-end fashion. Um, at the time, in 2009 to 2010, I was working at the Guild Group, and the the discount sites were really booming. A lot of customers were making their first online fashion purchase via a discount. It made it, made it easier. Um, and by the time I started Moda Operandi, that went live in 2011, uh, the full price market was, was really starting to grow, net a -Corte at the same time starting to boom. And now I think that that luxury customer is looking for something even more special, even more unique. Um, hence, my latest business, Tinker Tailor, which is all about customized fashion. Thank you. Jason, is e-commerce the future of retail? It's a big question. Um, I would say consumer direct is the big future of retail. And maybe that is, uh, it's you know, becoming easier than ever for companies to develop a direct relationship with their customer. Um, and I think whether it's online or offline, technology is making that more possible. Um, it's connecting supply chains, it is uh, making, helping companies get closer to manufacturers, helping companies uh, get closer to their consumers, to have a direct one-on-one -on -one conversation with them, um, making uh, everything more personalized and customized. Um, and you know, whether the sale happens online or offline, there's still technology behind it that's, that's making it happen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hakan, <clears throat> you act in a developing country in Turkey. What's the next level for e-commerce in developing countries? Where is the difference to the U.S.? Uh, of course, there are many pros and cons uh, of coming from a, a developing country because uh, we can see the, uh, I mean, we don't need to go through the uh, trial and error uh, phase that the uh, guys from developing countries are going. So we can get uh, good uh, examples from them. But uh, we are all learning in developing countries. When, when I say we, uh, the buyers, uh, the vendors, also the complementary uh, players like logistics and payment systems, we are all developing. So, and the economy is growing at a, a faster pace, and the portion of e-commerce in total economy is also growing. So I think uh, there's still a pretty big room to grow in the developing countries for e-commerce. What is the biggest topic in uh, developing countries for e-commerce? What are driving forces? Uh, actually, I think logistics is a big issue because, uh, I mean, in developed countries, uh, you can reach everyone like in a rapid pace. But uh, when you come to like underdeveloped or like still in the emerging market countries, 
uh, it's hard to get to the end con uh, consumer. It, it takes sometimes two or three days in uh, less developed countries. So I think logistics and payment systems are the main issues right now. Okay. So uh, I have a question first to Oslo and then to uh, Jason. It's about customization. You are both in businesses where you put customization as one customer benefit. Is customization the next big thing in e-commerce? I really believe customization is the next big thing. I think if you fast forward 10 years from now, customization or the ability to customize will be the general rule rather than the exception. That doesn't mean that, that every customer is becoming their own designer. These can be smaller tweaks like yeah. adding a sleeve to a dress or adding length. Um, throughout the last few years, I've heard so many times from women, I love that runway dress, but if only, if it only it had a slightly different neckline, it was slightly longer. So it's just about making items relevant for each customer. So I, th I think it's inevitable. Production is, is really what's holding it back. So I think um, as brands and designers start to build customization more into the way they work and shorten their lead times, and as 3D printing capabilities progress, and, and they're already very relevant for jewelry, uh, we're gonna see much shorter lead times and customization is gonna become more and more important. Jason, what do you think about customization, the next big thing in e-commerce? Well, you know, we see customization in the home category is all about choice. Um, mm -hmm. And consumers want more choices, uh, and especially in products um, where it's about a specific space. So if you're putting a bookcase in your room or you're putting um, a wardrobe, um, you want it to fit that space and you want it to have the features that, that you desire. Mm -hmm. Um, but for us, you know, we don't look at it as custom or non-custom. We look more at is what is the customer trying to achieve um, in terms of the product that they want to buy. And we have uh, products that are designers in-house as well as external designers we work with that they design. And then we allow consumers to go an extra step and put their own kind of twist or mark on it. Mm -hmm. um, and what technology is what's making all this possible. Um, we have a set of customization tools that are online um, at our site, hem.com which enables anyone to basically um, become an interior designer, uh, carpenter, architect, um, without having to call an expert and design their own furniture. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have a set of people on our team who, right now, they check that work and make sure that it's done properly, and then they transmit that electronically directly to the factories who are able to manufacture the pieces to the specs. And literally, the technology you know, connects directly to the CNC machine in some cases, um, which means you know, you're taking a lot of humans out of the process. Mm -hmm. um, in some ways, what I equate uh, what we're doing eventually in terms of customization of furniture or of, of home products is in a lot of ways to, say, the, the travel industry where there used to be travel agents. So you have mm -hmm. to call an expert in order to book a flight for you. Um, well, today, you know, the experts in, in our business are the interior designers, the architects, um, and we're enabling consumers to not have to call them, but instead they can uh, just go online, use our tools, and get directly, uh, directly mm -hmm. to make, almost you know, directly to the factory. Okay. Hakan, from, you know, a view from Istanbul, do you see also customization as a trend in developing countries or are they not there yet? Yeah. I'm, uh, even at Lidiana in our company, uh, customized items in like jewelry or uh, apparel, they are usually uh, preferred by customers because especially when they're get, getting as a gift uh, for a friend or like their girlfriends or whatever, uh, I think it's, it makes it feel more special and people tend to buy uh, it uh, more frequently if it's a customized item. And especially, like, because we are uh, having business partnership with some celebrities, uh, when we send a gift to them, when, and when it is customized, uh, that they can't give it away. So mm -hmm. it is uh, better for us when it's customized too. Okay. So, uh, Jason, what's the innovation in uh, supply chain and logistics? Are drones and... Uh, other, other stuff, same-day delivery, are they, this are the big topics, or...? You know, I think there's, um, I wouldn't say you know, exactly black and white, but there's almost two types of e-commerce out there that's evolving, right? One is kind of uh, mass e-commerce, which is all about convenience. It's mm. about speed. Um, it's Amazon. It's, you know, getting the product to customers as quickly as possible. And then there's another, which is more emotional commerce, which is helping people find you know, the exact product they want that makes them feel very special, like they had a connection with a designer or a maker or a curator. Mm. And I think with emotional commerce, it's actually less about speed 
And it's more about getting it right. It's about getting a high quality product at the right price. Mm -hmm. um, for us, the innovations in supply chain are less about, you know, we want to get a product delivered to someone quickly, but it doesn't have to be in two hours. Um, mm -hmm. You know, someone can get a new dining table in a week and be really happy with it if it's, uh, you know, designed to their specifications and a very high quality. Um, and so for us, the, you know, the really exciting technology innovations in supply chain are really connecting directly from the click to the factory to the consumer. Um, and so you know, basically taking out all the pieces in between that so that a customer you know, makes a purchase, um, that purchase is transmitted directly to a factory which is making something to that specification, and then that product is moving directly to the consumer with as few humans involved uh, as possible, but at a really high quality and at a great price. Okay. What do you think about supply chain logistics? Is that a driving force also in your business? <clears throat> I think it's extremely important. Um, now, for, for my business, Tinker Tailor, um, there, there is a lead time uh, for our own branded product. There's a six-week lead time for a designer product. It's typically longer. So it's not as much about getting the product immediately shipped to the customer. But if you look at fashion e-commerce in general and who is doing well at the luxury end, it really is this often that that purchase if, if it's ready there to be shipped women want it then and there I found myself making purchasing decisions just based on the ability to get the product within the next couple of hours so I think it is extremely important okay then let us continue with with some conversions so we, we see that some online stores especially in the US like Bonobos are opening up offline stores and vice versa offliners Mm -hmm. are going online. What do you think about the conversions? Is that what, a big trend for e-commerce? I think it is a big trend. I think uh, for, for brands that start as online brands, um, having a physical location really helps in terms of building a trusting relationship with the customer. It helps market the product. Um, even though Tinker Tailor is a very young business, we went live only in May, uh, we have certainly incorporated a physical element to our offering. Um, we haven't opened a, a full-blown retail location yet, but we have done multiple pop-up shops. Mm -hmm. And we find that that interaction with the personal stylist um, and the ability to, to touch and, and see the quality of, of the garments is something that's extremely important to the customer, particularly while building that, that trusting relationship. Okay. Do you see the same trends? In, in your countries? Actually, I think it's one of the advantages of being from a developing country, again, so we can uh, see the examples from uh, already developed countries, and uh, we, we see that uh, there are some successful examples for that. But uh, for us, right now, we m focus mainly uh, on the online sales, and uh, maybe after we say, okay, we, we, have, we have succeeded it, then it can be the time for us to try an offline store. But what do you think about the cost? So the question goes to, to both of you. Because one of the advantages of e-commerce is that you don't have stores and physical uh, uh, space. So you don't have the cost for that. And you have lots of other costs, of course. But then you add one element which was always said, this is a benefit of e-commerce, not having these you know, physical stores. What do you think about that? I, I, th I think for an early stage business, it is hard to, to launch with both, which is why we've used the, the pop-up shop methodology. But I do think the benefits outweigh the costs, uh, even if there aren't multiple locations. Having in, in a few key cities around the world over time as you grow, I think is, is critical to, to building a, a, a long-term successful business. Jason, do you have any plans, because you have the furniture stuff, right, to go also offline, pop-up shops or uh, regular shops? You know, in the, in the home furnishings business, uh, it's a $250 billion plus market where about 4% of that market is online today. Um, and so, you know, if you want to be in front of your customers, uh, online is the growth market, so it's growing at about 15% year over year. Uh, but you still, you know, there's other places you need to be uh, when you're selling furniture and home products. Uh, and, you know, we look at the model for us is consumer direct. It's not necessarily about online or offline. It's about 
having that direct relationship with the consumer. Uh, we have a showroom in Hamburg, Germany today. We're opening up a large format store in Berlin in March. Um, and for us, you know, we distribute today to over 30 countries online. And we have a very large audience of customers. Um, the average order value is over 1,000 euro, um, you know, thousands of units sold in the first few months. And you know, there's good volume there, but it's not the only thing. And we see opportunity to develop direct relationship with customers. As long as you can get the economics right, um, we see that this hybrid model of having stores in some locations that are complemented by online uh, could work really well for us. Um, but we'll walk our way there. And you know, one of the beauties of, uh, of or the benefits of, of our business is it's not a cash and carry business. So we're not talking about stocking inventory close to a store um, and having kind of a distribution network at a store. For us, it's you know, we could open up stores slash showrooms, have interactive experiences in those showrooms, and then have everything still distributed from our distribution facilities that do the same thing for e-commerce. Um, and so that's something we're looking at right now. You ship to 30 countries. Yeah, we ship today uh, 31 countries directly, um, mm -hmm. and uh, the largest uh, country we sell to is uh, Germany, followed by uh, France, UK, US, um, okay. that are about even right now. Um, and uh, then we also distribute to another 10 countries via partners um, okay. as well. So I ask myself, does it matter where your company is located? Because you moved from New York to Berlin. Yeah. You also moved a few years ago from New York to Istanbul to found your company. Uh, you somehow moved from Iceland to, to New York. Well, but does it matter where your company, your e-commerce company is located? Well, I'll say, you know, our deciding to move the headquarters of our company to Berlin um, was really about getting as close as possible to the supply chain and the manufacturing. Um, so we, have, we do all of our manufacturing in Eastern Europe, uh, and we have 25 people in Warsaw who manage that. Uh, and then we have design and uh, R&D in Stockholm and Helsinki. Um, and so then we put uh, all the marketing, sales, and logistics, operations, customer service in Berlin, um, which is a great startup center. Um, it's a fraction of the cost of you know, being in New York and a lot easier to coordinate. Uh, and for us, you know, in terms of this point in time right now, uh, it's a, the best place for us to have kind of our headquarters. Um, now as we expand our sales around the world, we'll see. Um, but right now, it's working really well for us. Okay. How come, what do you think? Local, pre uh, so the location of your business, does it matter? Yeah, of course it matters, and uh, I think especially the speed of delivery is crucial in e-commerce, and especially again in developing countries, uh, people uh, tend to prefer offline, uh, especially because of the speed. Uh, therefore, uh, the warehouse should be close to the end user. So if you're uh, sending, like if you're delivering abroad. Uh, you should either have like some hubs uh, around the world or because first of all it's speed of uh, delivery also customs also mm -hmm. cost and when when it comes to returns it's like crazy so i think uh, having local warehouses is a critical point in delivery let's continue a little bit with lidiana so you started 3 years ago as a celebrity endorsed Sites and then you pivoted the company into an online lifestyle site. Can you can you share some experiences, reasons, and what's the next level for Lidiana? Okay. So uh, we started Lidiana in 2012 as a celebrity endorsed vertical jewelry vertical, and uh, it, the reason was actually at that time there were many uh, big players in fa Turkish fashion e-commerce and. Uh, we wanted to be the best in our world, as Seth Godin says, mm -hmm. and uh, we picked jewelry because besides all the advantages of focusing on one vertical, uh, jewelry is, like the items are smaller, it's easier to stock, and it's usually one size or adjustable, and uh, it's less capital intensive compared to other categories because uh, you can produce on demand. Uh, but uh, and we start as a vertical, but uh, because of our invest, investor uh, structure, for instance, like as you know, Arda Turan, uh, the uh, captain of Turkish soccer national team, is our investor. We were always in the news, uh, and like the celebrities that we are working with, uh, that made us like uh, everyone knew us, and uh, our effective PR and marketing activities uh, created a great brand awareness for Lidiana. And uh, since we were working with like top niche designers and like uh, local jewelry uh, producers, our brand image also kept at high level. And uh, we were selected 
as the hottest startup by Wired UK in 2012, and we got our first investment in 2012. So at that time, we had to grow. I mean, we had great traffic. We had good brand image. Uh, whatever we put on the website, it was selling like crazy. But we were just offering like uh, rings and bracelets and necklaces. So we said, OK, we need to grow. And uh, after that, we, like baby steps, we first introduced sunglasses and watches, which is also similar to jewelry because it's adjustable and it's usually one size. And then uh, we went into cosmetics because it's consumable goods. And whenever the uh, customer is done with the uh, cologne, for instance, they come back to the website and make one more purchase. So it increased both average basket size and also uh, the loyalty, because they were always coming to the website to get one more. And then we got into apparel and uh, shoes. But the critical thing was not to ruin the DNA of the company, because we were like a top uh, brand, uh, thanks to the like, jewelry and like, all the fashion, all the design. But when you get into like, apparel and shoes, uh, we were really picky when selecting the products uh, and the brands. And what's next? Uh, I mean, until now, we always focused on growth. And uh, again, we have learned a lot from the developed countries. And uh, we need to focus on the bottom line from now on. Of course, we'll keep growing. For instance, in 2014, we grew 170% in one year. And this year, we're going to keep it low at like 50 60%. And uh, we want to become profitable by the end of this year. Are you, are you thinking about going international? Uh, yes, like eventually, uh, but uh, not in the short term, like in mid and uh, like long term. It's one of my dreams, like to be a global, to create a global company. So it's one of our eventual goals. Uh, Jason, <clears throat> the three biggest um, buzzwords in e-commerce at the time being are mobile, social and big data. Are they driving forces for your business? Well, um, I, I'd say yes, but. And I'd say yes, but in the sense that uh, big you know, data for sure. I mean, we're a, a very you know, data-driven, metrics-driven business. Um, you know, right now on our website, we're probably running a, you know, over a dozen ABC t tests of different varieties and measuring you know, different conversion rates and different pages and stuff like that. Um, and we're constantly scouring, you know, kind of every set of click data and path data to see what we can learn from it. Uh, social uh, is, is a big component. We find that um, people um, gladly share their latest design inspirations on sites like Howl's and Pinterest, and that drives a lot of traffic to us. Um, we've seen a shift in, uh, in social over the last few years um, where, uh, I'd say, you know, where, where Facebook uh, and Twitter used to drive a lot of the, of the social traffic uh, to sites like ours. It is more a uh, place like Howl's and Pinterest, um, where it's more about inspiration. Um, and, uh, and then you know, mobile, you know, we find you know, almost half of our emails are opened up on a mobile device first. Um, but shopping today, uh, for or at least in our category, about 10% of purchases are done on mobile, um, which is different than at Fab, where we had about you know about a third of all purchases happening on mobile. So it's much smaller items, um, and uh, you know our average order value of 100 euro um, is you know not not yet entirely on mobile. Yeah. How is the mobile e-commerce on your side? I, I I think for online fashion it might be different. Yeah, mobile has become so important for online fashion, whereas yeah, five years ago, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of um, luxury customers were making their first online purchase on their laptop. We hear from so many of our customers now that they don't want to shop on their laptop. They want to do it on the phone while they're in their summer house in the Hamptons or, or on their iPad. Um, we have the same experience with our emails that a very large portion of them is, is being opened on the phone. Um, we, we, because of this, are, are, have prioritized launching our, our app, uh, which, which will be happening just before Fashion Week. But even, even um, the communication between the customers and the personal stylists, whereas a lot of that used to happen by email, now they prefer text or WhatsApp to hear about the latest styles. How, can, how is the mobile uh, purchasing rate? Especially, like, the growth is like crazy, uh, and uh, right now 40% of our sales are coming from mobile at Lidiana. And again, like luxury segment is special. They have the smartphones, and the mobile penetration is pretty high in Turkey. 
So, uh, and it's more user friendly, and you can use it when it's your free time rather than when you are working or like you are like for students like when they are doing their homework or whatever. So, mobile is, uh, I think, much more uh, like people are tend to buy. Uh, much more on mobile, and we see that traction in our case too. When when do you expect that your mobile rate uh, will go over fifty percent? I'm asking you because I think you have the highest mobile rate. <laughs> uh, I think, uh, I mean, revenue-wise, it can pass this year because uh, the average basket size of the transactions are higher mm -hmm. uh, than the desktop versions. So, including the mobile side, Android and iOS applications, everything. Uh, even the tra transaction numbers should pass in one year or so. It's will you, if you cross the 50% mobile sales, will you define yourself as a mobile commerce company? <laughs> or are you still an e-commerce company then? I think uh, we don't need to distinguish mobile and e-commerce anyway. It's just, it's mutual and I think it's just e-commerce and it includes both mobile and desktop and like applications, everything. So I think uh, mobile is not a Subcategory anymore. It's just, it's, it's that. That's it. Okay. So uh, I have one final question to all of you, Jason. Let me start with you. Do you believe that Alibaba will buy eBay in the future? I have no fucking idea. <laughs> <laughs> Hakan, what do you think about Alibaba buying eBay? Do you do you mean, is it going to be able to, or should it <laughs> buy it? League. What's your opinion? I mean, are you What's more talking about a Chinese I, 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 company coming into the U.S. by buying a large U.S. company? Is that the, the broader question? Um, uh, that's that's all. I think this would be the first uh, acquisition of a major U.S. company from a Chinese company. Which is, if this happens, I have no clue if this will happen. If I'm Alibaba, I don't buy eBay. There's no need. Excuse me. There's no need. If I'm Alibaba, I don't buy eBay. Okay. I think it, it would be so ch charismatic for Jack Ma because, like, coming from China and uh, acquiring a, such a like well-known company from the U.S., it would be like great for himself and also his country. So, I think, like, money-wise, he can purchase it. Would you and buy if you would be? I would definitely buy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what do you think? Well, about 10 years ago, while Meg Whitman was CEO of eBay, the founder of Alibaba said to her, while eBay is the shark dominating the ocean, Alibaba is the crocodile owning the rivers. And what he meant by that was that each could win on their own turf. I think the Alibaba crocodile is no longer a freshwater crocodile. He's become a salty crocodile, and he's ready to attack the shark on its own turf. Okay, we shall see. Thank you so much. Jason Hakan Oslo, thank you so much for listening. <clears throat> we can take, uh, we have a few minutes for questions. Maybe we can take two or three questions. Any questions? <laughs> Oscar, join us. <laughs> Hi, Sina. Hi, panel. So yesterday we heard this tour de force going through um, all kinds of you know, Amazon, Facebook, four horse riders. One of the theses was that uh, um, car sharing companies like Uber or transport startups will disintermediate Amazon um, because the logistics costs are much lower. What is your take on that? We are absolutely in favor of anybody who takes down logistics costs. <laughs> If you want to help us get products to customers faster, bring it on, please. Well, I think one of the points that was, was raised yesterday, which was very important, is, is Uber and um, Airbnb have managed to um, come with a, a supply side that, that bears no cost for them. And uh, I, I think that's something that's very important to take into account. Uh, it's certainly what we have done with Tinker Tailor as well, and in my previous company, Moda Brandi, reducing the cost of, of supply down to almost zero by putting product on the site that is uh, made to order. Any other questions? Okay, then thank you so much. Thank you very much.